सर वी हैव एडमिटेड द स्टूडेंट एंड सर वी आर रेडी टू गो सर थैंक यू सर ओके थैंक यू गगन जी so uh, i invite dr arun prashad to give an welcome address to our speaker professor dimitri polnikov mm -hmm. dr prashad over to you yeah so our own dear uh, professor stephen barnes uh, professor dimitri polnikov uh, my faculty colleagues and uh, students uh, again this is part of the international teaching month and uh, international teaching month is a part of annual feature it's a feature event at ilu and as part of this event we believe in taking new ideas learning new paradigms in different disciplines and by doing that what we come to is law life and diversity the very rightly coined tagline for this event law life and diversity was given by dr kunal kishor i am happy that uh, he is also there with us so uh, if you look at today's schedule uh, talking about the diversity we had uh, ip debates followed by we'll be having alt um, artificial intelligence and copyrights and uh, another session today we'll be having in climate change so if you look at the kind of topics that we are going to deliberate today it is uh, pretty apt that we also go into legal history and to talk about legal history we have professor dimitri polniko uh, who is an expert in this area i welcome uh, professor dimitri polniko for this session and uh, on behalf of institute university students and faculty it's a pleasure to have you we thank you for uh, sparing your uh, valuable time for this session and i am very hopeful that all of us will learn through this session uh, welcome again to the international teaching month professor dimitri polnikov oh thank you thank you uh, uh, professor prashad for this kind invitation uh, and your uh, kind words uh, uh, greetings from snow white and frosty moscow region uh i'm still in the countryside on a lockdown on mobile connection and that explains why uh, i present uh only audio signal and my photo instead of a uh, video connection because i resemble more well, a teaching professor on this picture than uh now uh in real life uh and uh, uh i believe uh, uh we we all have uh, well uh, we're all privileged uh, to attend uh, this um, international month uh, at uh, nirma university uh, because of uh, that kind of diversity of speeches that uh, uh, its presenters uh, offer uh, and i would like to contribute uh, to this magnificent uh, choice of uh, topics uh, with the with my presentation on comparative legal history uh this is the area of my expertise uh, uh at the faculty of law high school of economics moscow uh and i believe that uh it well, uh the early 21st century is just the right time to think uh, uh and look closer uh at this discipline that is comparative legal history so i intend uh to uh offer some preliminary explanations as to why should we bother about uh comparative legal history now uh what this uh, idea of comparative legal history uh, is all about and what it can offer us and how can we compare meaningfully different legal traditions uh, or different legal systems throughout uh, the world and throughout uh, history in fact uh and uh this presentation uh, is uh for half an hour i intended uh, uh as a half an hour presentation and then uh, uh we will uh look into some feedback and q and a session uh and whether uh the idea of comparative legal history appeals to you so uh this uh feedback is also valuable to me because uh, this is a work in progress 
uh, as I will show you the suggested reading towards the end of this presentation, uh, uh, there will be no specific textbook on comparative legal history, full stop. There are textbooks on comparative law, on some areas uh, of legal history, like European history, uh, but not well, a general textbook. Uh, it's a work to be done, it's a work in progress, uh, and it's also uh, up to you, students of the 21st century, uh, to shape uh, the content of this uh, uh, textbook uh, through your questions and feedback. So, uh, let us start. Uh, why comparing legal history? Well, uh, <laughs> I suppose that uh, almost any presentation in the 21st in, in 2020 and 2021 uh, must start with some allusions to the pandemics. Uh, and you all see that uh, different societies uh, react in a different way towards uh, this uh, difficult situation. There is different there are different levels of trust towards the uh, governmental measures and uh, suggested uh, ways to uh, to tackle these difficult situations. In some societies, like for example, Taiwan, uh, uh, the society follows the suggestions of the government very closely through uh, the first and the second wave. And I believe they, they didn't even have the second wave. Uh, in other societies, uh, <laughs> The, uh, in other countries, the society uh, doesn't have even the choice to follow, not to follow. Uh, that's on the other side of the channel in the mainland China. Uh, a, a more curious case uh, uh, is countries of uh, the European Union and Russia, uh, where uh, they started with some kind of uh, following the suggestions of the government, and then they stopped following the suggestion during the second wave. Uh, why that might happen. Well, and that all brings us to the idea of uh, trust of the people uh, to the law in the society. Uh, and the very sensitive issue of, um, uh, of the quality of the law. Why can you trust the law, right? Because uh, it's a quality body of rules. Uh, and uh, the issue of sustainable trust to the law. It's not that you trust it today and perhaps tomorrow, it's uh, whether you trust your law for over a longer period of time. Uh, and uh, it looks like uh, that kind of question, which is very appealing to the 21st century, the question of the, the law can provide that uh, uh, way of cooperation and tackling with global challenges or national challenges, uh, uh, that kind of question of sustainable uh, uh, obeying to the law, sustainable trust to law or sustainable rule of law, as you call it properly in legal terms, uh, calls for some historical perspective. You cannot understand the phenomenon uh, of uh, why, let's say, uh, most Russians prefer not to go to the courts uh, when they have a dispute and litigation and resolve it in some other ways if you don't know Russian history. You won't know uh, why uh, Germans on the contrary prefer to go to courts uh, if they have disputes uh, because they trust the law. So uh, it, it, co it calls our attention to legal history uh, and uh, uh, some uh, path dependency as they call it. In other words, uh, you might need to go uh, for that uh, longer uh, perspective, even if you study uh, contemporary law and com comparative law. Uh, so uh, what do I mean when I uh, talk about comparative uh, legal history? Well, comparative legal history uh, is about uh, comparative law done in historical perspective. And I believe uh, it's time to share uh, the presentation that I prepared, or at least one slide. Uh, the uh, a uh, key question here uh, is how to compare, in fact. Uh, 
the, the idea of going to the past and that law today depends somewhat on the past is not new. Uh, the new thing here is how to compare meaningfully different uh, legal systems and different laws. Uh, and uh, I will talk now from the uh, European uh, perspective, uh, also uh, Western European perspective, because that tool of comparing laws was devised uh, in the late 19th century by uh, European scholars, also Russian scholars, and uh, I am more familiar with uh, their ideas. So how to compare uh, meaningfully? One uh, option uh, is to look at the law in books. Uh, in, on the content, they call it dogma like teaching, uh, and uh, uh, you compare the dogmatic structures uh, like trust uh, in Anglo-American law uh, or uh, uh, property rights uh, uh, in uh, continental law, uh, contract law, and so forth. The uh, upside uh, with this uh, mode of comparing is that uh, you do legal work. Uh, you get yourself busy with specific uh, legal uh, constructions. Uh, you do not uh, distract yourself with the, uh, some moral considerations or religious considerations, uh, you do legal work. The uh, downside with this comparison is that you are limited to the uh, dogmatic constructions that are common, uh, that are shared uh, by the countries you take into consideration. You can compare property law uh, in Germany, France, Italy, uh, and well, Russia to some extent, but you cannot compare it uh, with uh, England well, and further on to America because of the different dogmatic structures, different legal structures. How to uh, overcome this difficulty? Uh, this is the second option, the functional comparison. Uh, the idea of uh, function goes back to the social purpose of law. Law is not uh, only about some symbolic values. It's not only about historical representation of your identity. It is about, and mostly it is about resolving disputes and organizing the society. Uh, you use law in order to achieve something. And this something is called its function, of functions in plural. Organizing the society, resolving disputes, uh, restoring something which is called justice. Uh, and uh, if you start uh, with the, uh, not with the dogmatic constructions, but with the social needs, let's say, uh, can I uh, trust my uh, counterpart in contract? Can I uh, enforce uh, the promise that he gave to me? Uh, rather than asking uh, what is the formal requirements uh, for, uh, for a legal construction called contract. So if you start with the social need to ensuring um, the promise that you receive from your counterpart, you start from the functional uh, perspective. And you can bridge the gap between uh, the uh, different societies uh, which have different laws. Uh, but there is another drawback, uh, another caveat with this functional comparison. Uh, you need to start uh, with uh, the societies uh, where, uh, uh, where you can find similar social needs. Well, obviously, you can compare societies in the 20th century and 21st century because most developed societies have similar needs. There is market economy, uh, there's free trade in some extent. Uh, mass media, uh, internet communication, or, or consumer society, and so forth. But what if you go deeper in history? Uh, you might find that uh, not every society uh, uh, share the same social needs in ancient times, medieval, and contemporary. Uh, and uh, moreover, if you focus on these uh, social needs uh, that law serves, 
uh, you become uh, more uh, like a sociologist rather than a lawyer. There is some difficulty with this. Uh, how to cope with this? Um, well, uh, you, you, you definitely don't want to reduce law only to the means of social construction because it will um, make uh, it somewhat poorer than it was, in fact. So how to overcome this second, uh, the, the limitations of the second approach? That is the third one, the cultural comparison of law. And uh, it comes with the discovery that law is not only about resolving disputes, really. Uh, it is about reflecting well, social values, social identity, uh, and also some cultural stereotypes and biases. And uh, that's how the idea of uh, law as culture emerged. And if you understand law as culture, you can start with comparing uh, laws in context uh, of its cultural surroundings. And you can think about different ways of understanding uh, how society perceives law, how it understands law, uh, what's the idea behind the laws. Uh, the uh, drawback of this third approach is that you may uh, uh, bog down uh, to uh, cultural studies. You may end up as cultural anthropologist. Well, culture uh, is immense. Uh, sometimes it is compared to civilization itself. There are more than 200 definitions of what culture may be. Uh, there are fewer definitions of what legal culture is, but still there are a lot ways of understanding it. So uh, we uh, may want to find some middle ground uh, between all the three approaches. Uh, I call it middle way, a combination of approaches for comparison in context uh, and uh, with the view of some particular question. Just another picture uh, to give you in mind. Uh, you all know that we live in the society that is immersed in information. There are uh, terabytes of uh, video on YouTube where we broadcast our uh, uh, conversation now. Uh, there are even more uh, web pages on the internet how to plow through all this uh, storm of information. Uh, well, another example, uh, it comes from a conference uh, on uh, cognitive science, uh, very fancy science these days, which study how our brain functions. Uh, that's the, uh, the, the most difficult thing uh, in our universe, except the universe itself. Uh, and uh, there are over, uh, 30,000 participants of this conference, the conference in San Diego, California. Uh, it's uh, more numerous than any legal conference on earth. Uh, and it is not possible to hear all the presentations. So what did they uh, suggest? Uh, they suggest that uh, most presenters uh, uh, make the poster uh, of their presentation uh, with the basic ideas only like this slide, right? Only the, the main ideas. But the problem is uh, if you place all the posters of these participants uh, along one line, it will make up to uh, 24 kilometers. 24 kilometers of posters. <laughs> it's not possible to digest this information uh, for a single human being. So, how is it possible uh, to present the idea of legal uh, world legal history for uh, younger students uh, within one single course? That's the idea that the daunting challenge that I continue to struggle with because at my university I have only four months uh, or four and a half months to present uh, my students with the diversity of, um, of legal history in the world. And my answer here uh, is to uh, ask some uh, crucial, meaningful question, uh, which is quite important for my country and most countries in the world. That is, why people obey the law? 
why people trust the law? Why do they trust their law? How does this regime emerges? Uh, why is it sustainable? Uh, and uh, my answer here, I won't go into much of the details because I know it's hard to maintain the focus uh, when you follow uh, the presentation online. So it's a triangle, very basic. Uh, well, it, it resembles uh, the pyramid, uh, very stable and all the structure on earth. Uh, and the explanation here is that uh, you need to have some political competition uh, on the high level of uh, the elites of the society. This competition must be framed within some uh, legal body of rules, within the legal framework. This legal framework uh, rests upon the law, which is trusted and well designed. Uh, and it is sustained by uh, a core of professional lawyers. Those specialists who understand how law functions uh, and uh, who maintain the uh, demand for law. So this is the triangle that might explain you why in some societies uh, the rule of law, oh, th there is a transition from the rule by law to the rule of law. Uh, the law is used not only as the means of well, uh, governing, but also becomes to be perceived as a value. And most importantly, why this regime holds on, why it sustains challenges. Because the regime of the rule of law is not only the result, uh, as we all understand now, uh, it's also the process of maintaining this regime. So that's the main idea of the presentation. And uh, uh, during the rest of it, uh, I will just uh, flesh it out with more information, with some examples, uh, just to confirm whether this uh, um, basic scheme stands the test of, um, of time, right? So uh, in order to present the diversity of uh, legal systems throughout uh, history, you need to have some structure uh, that will help you to distill the meaningful information. Many scholars uh, would say that law or the law uh, is too narrow uh, because it does not cover some meaningful elements. Uh, and uh, they, as I suggest to use the term legal traditions. First of all, because uh, it encompasses law. Well, if uh, you look closer, right, uh, the law proper uh, is part of the third element particular doctrines and rules here on the slide. That's uh, what we usually call the law. Contract law belongs to this part. Uh, uh, constitutional law belongs to this section, inheritance and so forth. But it's not enough to know just the rules because the rules can be applied and understood, right? Understood and applied uh, through different, multiple different ways. There is the second layer to it. Uh, I called it uh, general theories, but uh, as uh, Professor uh, Prashad called it, uh, there is a paradigm shift. And I thank him for this term paradigm because I also use this term legal paradigm. It's a mental box uh, that helps you to pose the question can't think of another legal question if you are not within the paradigm. So legal paradigm as general theories, where and how to find legal solutions, like sources of law, uh, how to understand those sources of law, how to apply them. And of course, that is the first and most important layer. Uh, we all understand that law is for the people. Uh, and it is made by the people or the elites of those people. 
so it is about society and its institutions social groups state officials right judges lawyers uh, uh, you need to understand uh, who is where uh, in each society in order to understand how the legal traditions function in order to resolve to maintain social cohesion and resolve disputes right uh, but so far it's just the structure that you can apply as a filter to most societies well i don't claim to study all the world legal history but the uh, societies that we include into the course on legal history at our university well it stands the test so far we'll see how it rolls out uh, in the future all right uh, so uh, but obviously, the societies and their legal traditions are different. How different they are from one another? How can we understand the diff this difference? Uh, and uh, as I promised you, uh, there are several ways of uh, understanding this diversity and comparing this diversity. One way to do it uh, is to look at the function of this society. Uh, the function of law in the society. And on the basis of this criterion, I suggest that there are at least three basic kinds of law throughout history. The first type uh, is when you understand law as a means to resolve conflicts and maintain order. It doesn't teach you anything uh, it doesn't aim to govern anyone. Uh, it uh, means uh, only to resolve conflicts between the individuals that are on equal footing. Well, the second uh, type of law, an ideal type in the sense, uh, uh, is when you understand law as a path to correct or righteous behavior. Uh, it uh, enlightens you in a way. It guides you through life. Uh, it shows you where are the values uh, uh, to to where is the guiding star uh, in your life and in the social life. And the third type uh, is the law as an instrument of governance, not necessarily good governance, but just governance, ruled by law. So, uh, uh, as you see, uh, I've added some examples uh, under each type uh, of, uh, of law or type of law, right? Uh, Roman Republic uh, gives you as the example of uh, law as a means to resolving conflicts. English common law from well, medieval period uh, with some intermission during the uh, Civil War and War of, of the Roses uh, also presents you with this example. Uh, the second type uh, is best exemplified by uh, well, uh, early and classical Islamic law, Sharia law, uh, and uh, the Roman canon um, common law, which is called in Latin use community. Uh, and the third type, uh, well, that's a curious one. Uh, that's uh, where I would like to call your attention to. Uh, well, legal history uh, is, a, is it's not only about the past. Uh, it's about the development uh, from one point of time to another point of time. Uh, and uh, as our main question uh, in the course on legal history might be how to create the sustainable rule of law, the question is, uh, is it possible to transit from one type of law to another type of law? And the answer is yes, sometimes to the best, sometimes to the worst. If you look at the first example, like the Roman Republic, uh, the Romans uh, were perhaps the first uh, in, in the West, in Europe, uh, who created law uh, as uh, a way to maintain well, social status uh, and resolving disputes between equal individuals. But uh, 
uh, if you look at the, its history uh, in the imperial times uh, and the late empire especially, you would see that, uh, well, the population uh, was more and more progressively regarded as the subjects of the ruler. Uh, they were oppressed, uh, they were uh, converted into the serfs, uh, almost medieval serfs, and they fled uh, well, Rome. Uh, and law became the means of governance. Well, another example here uh, is transition from the second type, law as a path to correct righteous behavior uh, uh, with the Islamic law. Sharia law uh, to the law of the uh, Ottoman or late Ottoman Empire, uh, where the sultans and their administration appropriated, institutionalized uh, only one legal school of Islamic law. Uh, they uh, transformed uh, the teachers of those schools into state officials. They imposed only one way of understanding uh, Sharia law, uh, the official way of understanding it, uh, and they introduced more and more legislation uh, into this understanding of law, although well, Sharia typically does not recognize humans as legislators. And it transformed uh, the Islamic law, Sharia law, or uh, uh, well, yes, the Sharia law into the uh, law as an instrument of governance rather than uh, righteous behavior. And the last example here, uh, and the most telling one, is the Chinese Empire, the late Chinese Empire, oh, uh, the Chinese Empire through most of its history, uh, which is the uh, almost a pure example of the uh, rule by law. And here I will show you well this telling picture from the late imperial administration, Yemen, uh, which uh, show us or gives us the idea of the adjudication uh, in the late imperial China. Uh, you see the official in the center that pronounces its statement. Uh, you see two litigants uh, that prostrate themselves in front of the official who represents the emperor. Uh, and, uh, well, well, that's not the kind of law that uh, I would like to find me and my uh, children and my, my relatives to be, uh, to be in. Uh, so legal history, uh, uh, to, to, to finalize uh, uh, my monologue uh, on the topic uh, is not only uh, there to help us understand how one can um, move from law as, um, well, an amicable uh, resolution, right? If you, if you look at the very start of history, uh, it's, well, Africa, right? And, and dispute resolution through mediation. Uh, and uh, it is a soft law, so to say. Uh, you uh, try to find an amicable dispute resolution without imposing a rigid uh, uh, sentence, right? Uh, so legal history starts here, uh, and it may be used in order to explain us how uh, some peoples end up with that kind of rigid structure. And also it uh, may help us to think closer as to how to organize uh, our legal system according to this triangle uh, of factors that help us to maintain uh, the idea of law uh, as social value uh, and uh, as the principal means of uh, searching for um, the balance between the competing elites uh, and the competing parties to the litigation. So far, and this is the really final uh, remark here, this is the work in progress. And uh, I cannot yet recommend you, well, a single book, textbook, uh, that uh, outlines that kind of vision of legal history. But uh, the, the closest match, oh, it's not here, it's here. Uh, 
The closest match uh, to this vision uh, is the textbook by Canadian comparatist Patrick H. Glenn. Alas, he died oh, five years ago, but uh, he uh, uh, left us his magnificent textbook uh, on legal traditions of the world, sustainable diversity and law. Uh, and uh, he focuses on different ways of thinking about law rather than uh, the tradition, transitions between the patterns of law uh, and uh, the uh, societies uh, that are no longer existing, like Roman law, you won't find it there. But it gives you the idea. Uh, if you would like to go deeper into the topic of legal history, then the best way is to uh, look at the handbooks prepared by the uh, suggest the society, the members of the European Society for Comparative Legal History, uh, or the, the team of uh, scholars uh, working for, uh, uh, in order to produce the Oxford handbooks on legal history, whether world legal history or European one. Right. Uh, and, right, uh, as I promised, uh, uh, I spoke for about half an hour, not longer. Uh, I uh, intend uh, to uh, respond to your questions and listen to your feedback. And I draw your attention to the fact that I did not mention India. Uh, it was done on purpose. And as a way to start a dispute, uh, I would like, well, I have some considerations as to how le Indian legal history or Hindu law can be framed within this uh, typology and how it changed over time. Uh, but uh, I wonder whether you see your own legal history within this uh, typology and whether it makes sense to you. And with this, I conclude my monologue and uh, return the floor to the, speak uh, the, the chairman. Thank you, Professor Polnikov, for a very insightful presentation and thought-provoking uh, ideas that you shared with us all. By the time students uh, type their questions in the chat box, uh, I have few uh, uh, questions so that I am uh, so that I would be able to understand nuances of comparative legal history a uh, little better. So I just want to ask, uh, just to initiate a dis discussion, Professor Dimitri, I just want to ask a question. Why do we need to compare? What are, what are your thoughts on it? Why do we need to compare different legal traditions across the world? The short answer- And then we want to the question of how do we compare, you know, ah. which was a large part of your presentation. Yeah, yes. Well, naturally, it depends on your ambitions. Uh, if you uh, would like to be, well, just a small lawyer in a small village, then you don't need to compare laws. You will uh, spend your life in your local community, and that's it. But uh, I believe that those who attend this session, uh, they, they already witness uh, that kind of comparative effort. Uh, the uh, technology, uh, thanks to the technology, and alas, because of the pandemics, <laughs> we, we, we are all uh, uh, in this virtual uh, one uh, boat uh, and we are all facing uh, similar challenges, not only the pandemics, of course, it's also the climate change, also the technological advances and development and so forth. And the point is that uh, the societies need to cooperate with each other. What could be the basis of this cooperation? Religion, philosophy, well, uh, economy might be the, or the, 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 or the the basis for this cooperation. Technology might be, but uh, economy and technology does not give you the guiding light as to the values uh, 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 to protect. Uh, if you focus only on the economy, then it's about the money uh, that you would like to earn uh, through your activity. If it's about the technology, it's about more sophisticated ways of uh, well, uh, calculating uh, and passing on information. Uh, I suggest that law might be this universal um, 
foundation for cooperation between the societies. Uh, irrespective of whether you come from common law world, civil law world, uh, or traditional law, African law. The question here is, how can lawyers from different countries, different legal systems understand each other? Uh, if you say that, well, we will uh, start from scratch and write a new law, global law. Uh, so far, this project did not work because even the same words, well, there are some areas of truly global law, like international sale of goods. Uh, but uh, so far, even the same uh, legal terms, even the same words written in English are understood and applied in different ways in different jurisdictions. And the question is, uh, why does this happen? I believe that uh, comparative law cannot uh, resolve this uh, without the help of legal history, because uh, that issue uh, calls your attention to uh, something that uh, uh, something that we call path dependency, and that was I was trying to present you through this brief presentation. So, Pro Professor Polnikov, I do agree the value uh, in terms of comparison when we see that the world is globalized and. Uh, I do understand the value of your thought in terms of thinking law as a normative force you know, to, uh, to ensure justice to all. And these are these, but when we talk about the procedural aspects of law and the various traditions from that, uh, of, and the various traditions that influence the procedure or what we call, you know, in other words, force of law, then we do realize that it is not a question of comparison, you no, know, in terms of the rule of governance, uh, or it, one could see this comparison also in terms of the question you know, that how do we compare? So there, we, there has been an argument in comparative social sciences that how do we compare? Do we compare from the concepts brought outside the historical context of a law, or do we go back to the cultural traditions and the cultural context of a particular nation in terms of constituting that law. Because that gives, um, why I'm saying it, because it brings me to your second slide of the presentation where you made distinction between formal rules and you said it as a dogmatic comparison. And then you talked about the functional aspect of law. And the third was cultural comparison. Now, my question is that the fourth, the middle way combination of approaches that you are talking about, what are the challenges that you face in using the combination of either of the approaches in terms of comparing the legal traditions. Because I do agree with you that uh, these are not separate sort of branches in terms of thinking about comparative legal history. Because law at the same time is a social fact and at the same time it is a cultural reality. You know, so the cultural aspect of law, the social aspect of law in a way intertwines with each other. So then what are the challenges of doing it middle way, keeping in mind the question of power, you know, the hierarchy of nations within the global world order. So the hierarchy, the question of standing of nations, uh, how then we compare. Hmm. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Kishore for this uh, uh, co-presentation, I would say, right? Uh, it was uh, so loaded with uh, ideas and insights that uh, I regard it as uh, 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 I regard you as co-presenter here. Uh, thank you for this remark on different uh, ways of comparison and the challenges that uh, uh, a scholar faces when he goes through them or chooses between them. I say that the main challenge here uh, is to uh, pose the right question. What is the question that you would like to resolve? Uh, comparing for the sake of comparing does not work. Uh, it's not the process for the process. Right? Just We have uh, one hour and a half for, for this session. Let's compare laws. No. Uh, I looked through the list of the presenters, participants uh, at NIRMA uh, International, International Month. 
And I see that uh, most uh, of them uh, are very practice oriented. Uh, and that's the, uh, it's quite typical for lawyers these days and for law students, and also at my university. Lawyers are very practice oriented. Uh, we, we do not uh, reach for, uh, well, a pie in the sky, as they say it in English. Uh, but uh, and in on mo in most cases uh, uh, it is for practitioners, judges, uh, advocates, uh, uh, and and so forth uh, to uh, enlighten students as to how to do law. But there are some questions uh, where uh, legal academics, pure academics, uh, must step in. I thought about this area because it's it, it, it's my uh, uh, it's my area of expertise. Uh, should I remain an academic or should I uh, switch to well a practitioner, uh, an advocate, uh, or uh, a judge? Oh, judge? I can't be judge. <laughs> no, but anyway, so and this area is. Uh, one of the questions that I presented to you that calls for this uh, middle comparison is why do people obey the law over a long period of time? Why do, uh, why do Russians obey the law or do not obey the law? Uh, how uh, does this regime uh, emerge in the first place? How can we sustain it? Well, uh, this is uh, a daunting and very broad question uh, that uh, cannot be raised in the courtroom. Well, courts are not designed to answer that kind of questions. They resolve specific disputes. That's what they made for. And they, they have uh, tons of those disputes. They don't have time to uh, spend on his, uh, historical or comparative or, or whatever perspective if uh, it falls outside the specific scope of dispute adjudication. If you look at uh, the uh, kind of work of the advocates, they also focus very, uh, they are also very focused on pragmatic issues. Uh, but, uh, well, you may end up uh, with uh, 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 the situation when some regimes uh, looked more like the rule of law and then all of a sudden, over a period of uh, uh, five years only, they roll back to a more like authoritarian regime. Well, I know uh, you all might think about my country, uh, but uh, well, and I can tell you more about this, of course. Uh, but uh, I have some other suggestions in mind. Uh, uh, it might be the examples of such countries as Hungary and Poland. Uh, in Poland, which is also a Slavic country, uh, not that, that dramatically different in mentality from my country. Uh, Polish lawyers, uh, until 2015, well, since uh, 1990, until 2015, were very proud uh, of their legal system. They believed that they have uh, organized it in a way that there was the rule of law. And they pointed at us in Russia and they said, oh, we are Slavic, right? We also were part of the uh, socialist legal system, but we managed to overcome it. We organized our system as the rule of law system. And look at what happened uh, to Poland since 2015. There was a, uh, well, a new parliamentary election. There was a populist party, which is called uh, uh, Law and Justice, uh, which came to power. And they began to dismantle most of the pillars of the rule of law system. The separation of powers, judicial independence, uh, progression of human rights, and so forth independence of mass media and so forth. And now, uh, the, well, Poland is divided into the supporters of this populist regime and the opponents of this regime. And uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the lawyers in Poland are facing with this issue. Why did it happen? 
Why did it happen to us? We were almost there. We were there, as they said. And that kind of question cannot be answered by uh, judges or, or advocates uh, uh, on their own. Uh, that kind of question requires, uh, well, a cooperative effort. Uh, if I can draw your attention back to this slide of uh, for three factors, uh, it illustrates the interdisciplinary effort uh, that the question calls. Um, uh, of course, there, there must be lawyers uh, who could make sense of the legal rules. But there must be politicians who understand how the political system works. And there must be sociologists who understand how the law as the body of rules is perceived by the general public. And well, uh, I can easily see the place for legal anthropologists, uh, for uh, philosophers, uh, well, also for uh, the specialist on IT who might design well legal tech in order to make the legal procedures more transparent. Uh, but I also see the place for legal historians here uh, because uh, the, uh, the, there must be someone in this team of interdisciplinary studies uh, who might uh, uh, pull the right data from the past because we we are uh, uh, what what we are our current identity uh, is partially uh, and substantially determined by our past it may be more or less distant but it's you can't call it only present no society uh, can be regarded as well reinvented uh, in one particular year uh, and uh, as I come from Russia, I will finalize uh, this reply uh, with the example from my country. Uh, in, 2000, uh, in 1917, uh, in October 1917, there was a, a coup d'etat, October Revolution, uh, uh, and depending on your political affiliation. Uh, and those who came to power, the Bolsheviks, decided to reinvent Russian identity from scratch. Uh, yeah, well, we, we know history. Yeah? We know that uh, Homo Sovieticus did not appear in the end, uh, that there were some uh, elements of uh, national identities that reemerged uh, after 1991. And there must be, well, that's the work for legal historians here. But uh, there, there must be the precise question for comparison, what would you like to achieve through comparative effort? If you don't the, don't have this question, clear question in mind, uh, you will be exercising, uh, flexing muscles, uh, and it will be just an academic exercise. So uh, uh, the one who uh, who can pose this question can be also a legal historian, can be a philosopher. Uh, can be a practicing lawyer, uh, but it should be a clear question. One final thing which I intend to learn from your presentation, and then I'll pick up participants, students, and uh, other faculty members' questions, is you now you mentioned uh, the separation in terms of functionality of law and in terms of what law wants to achieve. And you said that law is a mean to resolve conflict in order, law regulates conduct, and law is an instrument of governance. Oh, I remember. Now, mm -hmm. all the three uh, constitution, uh, constitutive elements of law that you spoke about, I would just remind you that you chose to pick different cases. You know? So for um, conflict in order, you picked Roman law. For conduct, you picked Sharia law. And for instrument of governance, you picked up Roman and Ottoman Empire. I, I'm just reminded of a Roman law, which we used to read in our university days, Homo Sacer. No, mm -hmm. and that Roman law, when we used to study, you we, uh, we were told that it's not only a law which is an say instrument of governance or resolving conflict and order. So much so, it also regulates conduct. 
So mm-hmm. I just want to learn whether we can separate a uh, mm-hmm. legal tradition on the typology of conduct, because if we look at laws, whether we look at Roman law, whether we look at Greek law, and I'm reminded of Piero Hado, Hado's text, so, um, and he talks about a lot of uh, pre-Socratic uh, legal, uh, legal traditions within um, you know, Greece, we're reminded that law from, uh, the, from the conceptualization state was much more about regulating the conduct. And that mm-hmm. regulation of conduct would then lead to the resultant type of formation of political community. You know, mm-hmm. It's like we are, what we think of is that how the questions of nation as a legal order is weaved into a state, which is both a legal order and a political order. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm just, I just want intend to learn if we can, if we can think of intermixing these examples and mm-hmm. can we say that Roman law is a law which is an instrument to regulate conduct as well as constitute political communities. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And political right. and question of polit- yes. political law. Yes. yes. Yeah. Good. Good. Uh, thanks for this feedback. Uh, well, uh, I've mentioned that uh, this is a basic scheme, uh, and uh, it is closer to ideal types. These are ideal types, and uh, an ideal type, or well, is it? as a specific intellectual tool invented by German sociologist Max Weber yeah, but... in order to, in order to uh, uh, mark the starting point of your research, your sociological or historical research. An ideal type uh, is a const- construction uh, that uh, highlights uh, some basic features, uh, and you and uh, it prof- uh, proposes your hypothesis on the topic. Uh, an ideal type does not exist in reality. An ideal type uh, helps you to uh, find the starting point, not the final point here. Uh, and. Uh, uh, as, as I mentioned, uh, this uh, classification uh, emerged from uh, my need to explain within four months uh, the world legal history to my students. You don't have a lot of time of speaking about the differences uh, or particularities uh, uh, unless uh, you would like to uh, deceive your students uh, and bog them down into the details. So. That these are three starting points that you uh, may want to look at if you would like to uh, disentangle the difficulties uh, in legal history. Uh, and it refers uh, to the um, dominant understanding of law. Uh, it means that well, in our legal theory, Russian legal theory, there is the term, the legal uh, 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 type of legal understanding, how you perceive law, uh, what is, what, what's, what's your first association when you think about law. Uh, and uh, it does mean that uh, all members of the society have the same very association. Sometimes, uh, well, even in, in, in my country, some people would argue that uh, law is about means of resolving conflicts, or it's a righteous path, uh, or tools of government, or both, all the elements. Uh, what I suggest to do with this classification uh, is to mark uh, the uh, points of entry into legal history and make it somewhat understandable from day one. Uh, But uh, as you start with this simplified scheme, uh, you then show that the reality is more complicated than uh, uh, these three uh, ideal types. Uh, And uh, there are combinations. Well, law serves several uh, several purposes. Uh, It can be understood through various ways. Uh, and uh, typically in most societies, there are different uh, patterns of law coexisting. I, I, I feel it, it, well, it, it calls for some 
discussion on the application of this scheme to Indian legal history, right? Uh, because in my perception, uh, uh, what uh, Brahmins created uh, was closer to the learned law uh, in the second type, like the righteous behavior. Uh, and uh, at the same time, it was the ideal law of the upper uh, classes of the society, like Brahmins and Kshatriya. Uh, Dharma Shastras uh, uh, don't tell you a lot about the uh, lower classes of the society and their way of living. And it means that uh, even during the heydays of uh, this Brahmin tradition, uh, around the turn of the uh, first uh, millennium of, 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 of AD, common era, uh, even during that, that time, uh, this ideal law coexisted with um, a customary law, I suppose, on the ground. And then the curious uh, thing happened, right? Uh, when the British came, they introduced their understanding of law. Is the law as the means of adjudication, uh, law of the judges. Uh, well, and it's curious to me really how these two patterns might be combined uh, in the understanding of law in India. Well, whether it makes sense to speak about uh, these two patterns combine or uh, whether you see uh, your modern uh, law, Hindu law, as uh, primarily uh, common law uh, or whether it doesn't make sense at all to distinguish these three ideal types um, uh, in terms of uh, your legal history. Well, I will just add a note and we'll move on to a student's question. Uh, hmm. Indian legal history is also a history of violence. If we talk about in terms of you know, codes of conduct translated as you know, laws. So it's not only about uh, order because political order is always a question of political violence. We talk about social violence. There's a lot of theorization mm -hmm. of political violence in comparative legal history, but we also need to take up the questions of social violence. So you are right I mean, uh, in, in that. Uh, but I'm moving to now the questions uh, of some of the participants. One student, Manya and Jerry, ask a question. In this era of globalization, where law has attained a supranatural character and countries are adopting a general framework of laws to govern international disputes, how far the study of comparative legal history is relevant where legal pluralism is diminishing? Well, again, I go to uh, my uh, first reply to your first question. Uh, it depends on, on, on the research question that you pose. Uh, if you are intended to study intellectual property, then well, legal history won't be uh, your first uh, choice of research. Right? If you study uh, uh, IT law, uh, legal history uh, won't be of, help, uh, of, of much help either. Uh, but uh, if you would like to understand something that um, uh, we call uh, legal consciousness uh, or biases uh, or stereotypes, cultural stereotypes, then I suppose that uh, legal history is unavoidable. Oh, that, that, that at least that kind of uh, historical depth. Let's say... Mm, Contract law. Uh, contract law is the same around the globe now, right? Except that not quite. I can give you one example. Uh, the Russian Civil Code uh, uh, stipulates uh, an article uh, 420, I believe, uh, on the freedom of contract. It means that any um, uh, subject can enter into whatever contract uh, he wants, provided that it is legal, right? Well, basic caveat. Uh, at the same time, uh, when you go to Russian court uh, with uh, some atypical, non-typical contract agreement, chances are that the court uh, will not uh, enforce this contract on the basis of some... Uh, dogmatic considerations saying that, well, this is uh, uh, 
this contract uh, should be regarded uh, as the combination of two different contracts. Uh, uh, the, uh, there are the two different chapters of civil law must be applied to this, to regulate this contract. Uh, we will not honor this contract at the current state. It means that uh, you have the freedom of contract uh, in the law and books, in the code. Uh, and you don't have this freedom of contracts in the court of law. Why did it happen? Can you answer this question? Can you answer the discrepancy without uh, legal history only on the basis of comparison? I don't think you can because it uh, runs deeper to the, uh, 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 to the attitude of the judges in the 20th century. Throughout the 20th century, judges uh, were used to adjudicate uh, on the um, uh, prescriptions of con uh, typical, uh, well, yeah, typical contracts, in fact. Uh, and uh, they did not recognize contracts uh, that uh, uh, fell outside the scope of the type of contract, types of contracts. And apparently, uh, uh, this uh, it 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 had to do with the paternalistic attitude of, of the uh, governmental officials towards uh, the um, uh, uh, parties of the contract. The uh, there was no uh, free market economy in the Soviet Union, as you might know. Uh, the organizations uh, uh, engaged into economic activity uh, in order to fulfill the plan of economic development. Uh, and uh, you didn't need really the freedom of contract uh, for that kind of economic uh, exchange. And apparently uh, this attitude of paternalistic look onto the parties to the contract remained in the 90s, survived into the 90s and into the 2000s. Despite the fact that the legislation uh, has been changed. It looks like historic explanation to me. An explanation that uh, calls for the information from the 20th century at least. Or maybe even from the 19th century, uh, depending on the uh, your on your research ambitions, really. So uh, now there's a comment uh, by Professor Stephen Barnes. Uh, Professor Polnikov, very interesting, provocative presentation. Thank you. At a time when law schools, driven by education ministries, bar associations, and consumers, uh, law students promote more specialization. Example: cyberspace law, tax treatment on patient patents, and so forth. Your expertise area, legal history, comparative legal history, often sometimes gets marginalized in law curriculums. You have proven the value of legal history and comparative legal history having a much more prominent role. Ochen's Pasibo, thank you. I don't know how, <laughs> if I pronounced it well, and I don't know the meaning. Uh, so <laughs> thank you. And again, sorry, I don't navigate the Cyrillic alphabet on my keyboard. So that's the uh, comment for you. Uh, Rather very sweet. Uh, work. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for Steve, um, yeah. uh, Stephen Barnes, Professor Barnes, for this comment. Uh, uh, and in, in fact, encouragement. Uh, well, uh, as far as I understand, not only comparative legal history, which is not non existent as a, an academic discipline yet, I'm working on this, but even comparative law is somewhat marginalized uh, at law, uh, law curriculum. Uh, well, that, that's uh, not only, well, really uh, American or Russian uh, or any other national trend. Uh, it has to do with uh, the ambitions of the students. Uh, uh, my, my faculty, my university actually, uh, in the process, is in the process of uh, updating uh, its uh, curricula. Uh, uh, in a way that students would have more liberty uh, in combining uh, the subjects that in their in their uh, track. In fact, it's about uh, uh, giving them the opportunity to build their own study track. 
Uh, and mm -hmm. I see it as an opportunity uh, to uh, propose them uh, an instrument called comparative legal history uh, as their uh, optional field of study, uh, depending on their kind of research. I also believe that uh, the longer we live in the 21st century, and I hope it, it will be longer than shorter, uh, the more uh, influences from other jurisdiction, jurisdictions we will experience in our national jurisdictions. Perhaps not in the United States, which is big enough to, to stand on, on its own, but in my country, definitely. Well, in the countries of European Union, definitely. And it will create some additional demand uh, uh, on um, the um, instrument called comparative legal history. And the final remark, it's not only about the demand, it's also about the supply, right? In economic terms. As I showed you the suggested reading, I told you expressly that there is no single textbook on comparative legal history for the 21st century. It means that uh, there is no supply yet. Uh, we as academics, or I as a teacher of legal history, uh, do not offer our students well, a ready-made tool for this comparison. We're all working on it. Uh, and as soon as it is done, I will uh, engage into well, uh, talks with uh, the administration of our faculty to promote this discipline. So thank you, Professor Poltinikov, for a very uh, intellectually stimulating presentation. Thank you, Dr. Prashad. Thank you, my faculty colleagues. Thank you, Professor Director. If you want to say a few words, Professor. Yes, Dr. yes. Hello, Dimitri. How are you? It's great to have you. I'm sorry I was held up in some meeting and I couldn't uh, uh, join your session in the beginning. But how are you? All well? Oh, is it? yeah, yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. I'm so happy that uh, I, well, my internet connection stood until the end of this presentation, right? So oh, I'm still on audio. I'm so no, happy no. to see you. I'm so happy to see you. That was also uh, not certain whether I'd be able to receive video signal. Uh, and well, I'm, I'm happy to share my thoughts on legal history as a continuous uh, project uh, with uh, the colleagues and students of, of your faculty. Thank you it's, so it, much it, for joining it, us and we look pity. forward to have you well, on campus next year. Yeah, it's a pity we didn't have time to discuss how Indian legal system and Indian legal history frame with this uh, uh, idea, but well. Maybe next yes. time when <laughs> we organize a session. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we end this session. Thank you so much. <laughs>